Welcome to the Zion Salon Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. And uh, my guest today is Christian Smith. He is a professor. Uh, he is the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of Sociology at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, he holds an MA and PhD in Sociology from Harvard University, and he studied at Harvard Divinity School. And he's taught at Notre Dame, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and at Gordon College, Massachusetts. His new book is Atheist Overreach. And uh, the subtitle is What Atheism Can't Deliver. So you can imagine why I wanted to have Christian on the on the podcast. Uh, so we we get into all of that. Um, he really wanted to stay focused on the book, which is fine. Uh, toward the end, I do push him in, in, in terms of his own uh, theist um, support structure for absolute moral values or correct objective moral values or whatever you want to call them to get beyond, as you'll hear, his challenges to consequentialism, which um, most of the philosophies that like myself and Sam Harris, Steve Pinker, Philip Kitcher uh, talk about uh, kind of boil down to that uh, uh, consequentialist utilitarian type arguments. He wants to go for more than that, but as you'll hear, he can't. He really can't justify it uh, theistically. He's a Catholic, um, but um, but but almost the entire podcast is based not on a theist versus atheist argument. It's atheist overreach, and I think he has some good points um, uh, for. I think there's sociological reasons why sometimes atheists feel they have to overreach. Uh, but we really get into the nitty gritty of well, how do you know what's right and wrong, and. Uh, in my opinion, there is no absolute answer to most of these moral dilemmas. So uh, we get into it that way. So with that, and thank you as always for the support. Um, more and more people uh, have been supporting the podcast generally through Skeptic Society, and and we are a 501c3. So again, I encourage you, if, if you like the podcast, go to skeptic.com, hit the donate button, and, and whatever you can afford is great. If not, then enjoy the podcast, and I give you Christian Smith. So why don't you give listeners a little bit of background about you and, and how you got into studying uh, sociology. You have a PhD from Harvard in sociology. You're now at Notre Dame, uh, Notre Dame and, uh, and, and how you came to write this book. So you know, sort of take us back to how you got interested in, in all these topics. Yeah. Well, in college, I didn't know what I was doing. And then my junior year, I discovered sociology. And it fits me as a person and my intellectual proclivities really well and uh, decided that's what I wanted to do. So I went to grad school. I mean, I'm interested in things human, how, how things work, what causes things, how do you explain things. Um, but unlike a lot of um, sociologists, especially these days, in, in the past, sociologists were much more historically and philosophically and social theoretically oriented, but increasingly so many sociologists have become kind of narrow technicians. But I, um, I, I had just have broad interests. I'm interested in history and politics and society and philosophy. And, uh, as a sociologist, I want to know what does it mean to explain something? What is causation? You know, the deeper underlying questions that undergird the work we do. So I've always just read in philosophy, and I find moral philosophy and epistemology particularly interesting. Like, well, why should, why, how did the word should even get in there? Like, why should we do things, especially when they uh, ask us to make sacrifices for others or for the well being of the whole? I just find that to be a, a really fascinating notion. Um, there's a there's an article in uh, by a moral philosopher called the queerness of morality and it basically just says there's some there's a kind of a queer characteristic in the old meaning of the word queer that you know that that there's just somehow we think above and beyond us that there's a duty or a right or a law or something that com should compel us to do things that we otherwise might not do and and how and why that's the case I just find fascinating so I've bounced around in my career between empirically oriented sociology, kind of standard science sociology, and writing books like Moral Believing Animals that are more philosophical and theoretical exploratory. Where, are you, where were you born and raised? Uh, I was born in Abington Hospital on the north side of Philadelphia, so I'm mm. a northeasterner. I lived in Boston a long time, and then I lived in North Carolina a long time, so my northeastern harshness had its edge worn off a little bit by the Southern experience in uh, North Carolina. And now I'm in uh, Indiana for better or worse. <laughs> Were your parents religious or secular? Or? 
No, I was born into a, uh, I was born into a not religious household. And then when I was a baby, my parents became uh, evangelical Christians. So that's what I was raised in. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's quite a background. <laughs> yeah. So somehow I never understood how I got the name Christian when my parents weren't even religious. But uh, <laughs> Maybe later they were happy they named you that. Or maybe they thought it I was provi- so. providential. See, God I wanted so. you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but, and do you call yourself an evangelical now or no? No, 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 no. I, that's, I would, uh, I, um, or no, what, I don't. Or what do you call yourself? I mean, I've, uh, I'm, uh, I, I converted to Catholicism some time ago, but I, uh, have a, a, a fraught and uncomfortable relationship with the church in some ways. I'll put it that way. Well, there's a, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of good reasons to be uncomfortable with yeah, Catholicism. So, uh, you know, I'm an intellectual. That's how I make my living is thinking and teaching and such and writing. So that engages me in lots of uh, difficult questions about everything, yeah. which is fun. Now, you don't have to be Catholic to be at Notre Dame, though, do you? No, 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 yeah, no. Yeah, that's no. just a... a... Half the faculty plus one needs to be, but oh, we, I have, see. we have all different kinds. Yeah. 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 But it's a great institution. I mean, right. The students are really good and, uh, and and the academic standards are high. Oh yeah. It's an elite school. Our undergrads are fantastic. We have really good grad students. So it's a, I have one of the best jobs in the world. I think it's an amazing place. Yeah. No place is perfect. You know, you can always critique, but I'll focus on the positive. <laughs> yeah. So your 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 book, somewhat critiquing atheism, though it, I should point out, is, is not coming from a, a believer's perspective. That's not the point of it. Uh, and I thought I, I would just read your your um, claims and clarifications in the book because it's it's so well stated. To be clear, let me restate what I am not claiming here. I'm not arguing that atheism is wrong. I'm not arguing that theism is right. I'm not saying that atheists have no reason to behave ethically. I'm not suggesting that atheism leads to moral nihilism. I'm not saying that science is incompatible with atheism. I'm not suggesting that all people are somehow covertly religious. And I'm not saying that secular people and cultures cannot live happy, meaningful lives. Which is exactly what most of the theists I debate do argue. So I I liked your approach because this is something completely different. So tell us what you think is the issue with atheism that that, uh, concerns you. Right. So my book is not arguing for or against atheism or theism. My book is saying, look, if atheism is true, what are the implications of that? Um, The first half of the book is about morality. The middle of the book is about religion and science. And the last part of the book is uh, about whether human beings are in some sense religious by nature. But the main the main argument up front is about morality. And basically, uh, I'm just saying the following. I read a number of atheists as making pretty uh, ambitious claims about how moral humanity can be in an atheistic universe that I find to be um, indefensible. I think atheists have good reason to uh, to live morally. Um, I mean, and by good reason, I mean they can explain, give a a rationale for why this is the case. give an explanatory rationale for why and everybody should live morally and uh, to give a justifying motivation for why people should care to do that. Not just an idea in their head, but like, oh, okay, I have a good reason to actually do that. That's what I mean by um, have a good reason. So I think a- atheists have good reason to live morally by what I call a moderate or a modest standard of morality. But when I read atheists who say, uh, who who reach further than that? Uh, Philip Kitcher is one, but there are many others who say uh, we need to respect universal human dignity and universal human rights, and every and I have a moral obligation to care for everyone on the planet, no matter where they live or how reprehensible they behave, and um, so sort of the, the inheritance of universalistic benevolence toward all human beings and and universal human rights. Um, I don't, I I can't find, and I'm not persuaded by any of the arguments put forward for why, if somebody's an atheist, they should be compelled to aspire to that high standard of morality. So, well, not compelled, but, but they choose to do that. Intellectually compelled. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. (laughs) By by reason of reason, they should, they should derive that. Yeah. And and be able to persuade other people too, to be able to give good reasons to say, Hey, here's the kind of world we should live in. 
that that actually adds up intellectually. Let's clarify who we're talking about here in terms of atheism. What do you mean by atheism? Uh, I mean, there's kind of the narrow definition that it's just the null hypothesis on the God question. I just don't accept the evidence for God, therefore I'm an atheist. But there's nowhere to go from there. It's just I don't believe in God, full stop. Uh, the positive assertion would be something like I'm a humanist, secular humanist, or enlightenment humanist, or I believe in science and reason, and I believe in rights and logic and love and so on. So in other words, atheism is just kind of a negative statement that you really can't build on, mm -hmm. but but th that's my own take on it. I think most people do believe much, have a much broader uh, con conception of atheism. Yeah. So I uh, formally, I, I think either of those would fit into my argument. And what my argument is about is, okay, let's talk about the kind of humanism that we have good reason to believe in. The kind of uh, to. Uh, to want to form a world in that direction and are we being intellectually consistent with that so for me i think a lot of it is well let's fill in the details and talk about what we mean by who we will love how far that will extend and why right um, but essentially behind it is the assumption there is no divine being whatever you might call that divine being that, that doesn't exist that that was a mistake of the human imagination and history and we are, as far as we know, until we meet other life forms sort of on this planet by ourselves, it's our consciousness, it's our capacities, it's our interests. That's what we have to work with. That's it. There's no judgment day. There's no natural law from, from God, at least. So that, right. that's what I essentially mean as a background. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. And part of the reason we, we push for something maybe overreaching, I'm sure I'm one of those, uh, is because, you know, theists p push hard on us saying, you know, if if there's no objective morality, something outside of our own selves, our own minds and culture, um, that therefore Hitler got away with it. You can't really say the Holocaust was wrong. There's no objective standards that say slavery is wrong. Uh, you can just say it's wrong, but that's just your opinion. I'm giving the theist argument here. Mm -hmm. And so one reason people like Philip Kitcher, Sam Harris, who you also discussed, myself, others kind of maybe we do overreach maybe not i don't know but 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 there's kind of a pushback like yes there is a it's not just relative morality it isn't just my opinion that slavery is wrong i can ask other people and that they don't want to be enslaved that it's a, i think of it as you know collecting data in a scientific way on what people want they want rights is that objective i guess the problem is what do you mean by objective you know we're looking for Theists want something outside of the mind and culture. Right. We, we can't give that. There is nothing outside of mind and culture. It's just right. us, as you said. But but I do want to – but then the default position there is, well, then you're saying it's all relative. It's just your opinion. It's yeah. like, no, I so, don't want that either. <laughs> yeah. In this book, uh, you know, I'm clear, and, and you just read one instance of it. I'm clear. I do not believe that if atheism is true, everything collapses into absolute nihilism and there's no reference for anything. I think you and I, I, I did, I read some of your work and you and I agree that the way things are, like, I, like I'm not a human, uh, facts and values must be radically separated. I, we agree the way reality is, the way human beings are, uh, the way things operate causally gives us a lot of information to feed into reflection about how we want things to be or how things should be. Um, so I, I don't, I wouldn't take that strong position uh, that you just articulated some theists would take. Um, but I do think perhaps in reaction to that, I do think that there, are, uh, that there are claims that some atheists and not all do. Again, I'm not saying this is atheism. I'm saying these are a number of atheists I read do overreach. They do want to claim more than I think is rationally justified. My own reading of that sociologically is we have inherited, especially in the West, that may be controversial, but we have inherited uh, a humanism. We have inherited a sense of the dignity of human people. We have inherited the idea that um, hu there's something special about human beings. You can't treat them like things. And uh, I think you and I disagree on this. I think you read that historically as coming from sort of post-Christendom. I read that as deeply rooted in ancient Judaism, mm. uh, the I uh, Christian ideas of uh, of, of Christ, the incarnation, etc. But my point is, 
we've inherited these things and they're, they're hard to let go of. Nietzsche thought he could do that. He could just make a clean break and just, to, and just throw it all out the window. Um, they're hard for us to say, well, I'm, I don't believe in universal human rights. I don't think I necessarily have a moral obligation to take care of a tsunami victim on the other side of the world. I, I, I'm an Aristotelian, if anything. And so I do think that's why I think the is helps to specify the ought. And I do think that what human beings are, are and are here for, so to speak, is to be happy, is to live a, a rich, full life of flourishing. So both of us use the language of flourishing. And, uh, but then the question is, what does that oblige me to exactly in the details, not in the broad outline, but if, if, uh, if we're all here to flourish, who am I obliged to also help flourish? Especially when that requires sacrifice of me. Yeah. It seems to me that it's totally justified for somebody who doesn't have any accountability to a divine being to say, well, uh, I, my self-interest should be an enlightened self-interest. It shouldn't be an idiotic self-interest. It should be long-term. And I think what that leads to is I should care for people I care for. I should, I should be moral in contexts that matter to my long-term outcomes, my happiness, I don't think it leads to, and Aristotle himself certainly didn't think this, leads to universal benevolence in human rights. On this, uh, just on the historical trajectory of these ideas, if you're an mm -hmm. Aristotelian, this certainly predates Christianity and, yeah. and, and uh, you know, and, and the, the track from Aristotle to Aquinas and, and Catholicism and so on, that that seems like more of a secular grounding of those ideas than religious, yeah, actually, or maybe both. What I should say is I'm a neo-Aristotelian. If I was an Aristotelian, I would think women are less than men no. and slavery is perfectly <laughs> right. fine. So right. that's okay. what Aristotle is. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a neo, I mean, I, t I accept this kind of general framework. But I think in terms of our cultural inheritance, Aristotle has been mediated in the West through uh, a lot of Jewish and Christian doctrines. I won't venture to say anything about Islam because I'm not, I don't have the expertise, but that um, so that a lot of modern secular people, whether they believe in Christ or not, are still inheritors of millennia of cultural formations that have religious roots. Yeah. So why should I be nice to other people that are not my kin and kind? All right. So it starts with, um, let's just start with Dawkins' selfish gene, which as he famously said, people read by title only. He could have called it the cooperative gene. Uh, uh, that sometimes the self, the most selfish thing I could do is to be nice to other people around me so that they'll yes. be nice to me. And so from there, we can build from kin selection to reciprocal altruism. So we, we can get the, the, the circle of sentiments out a little ways. Yes. Once you're past, say, you know, you, your, your tribe, your clan, it becomes much more difficult. You need many more social tools and technologies uh, develop trust between people that don't know one another. So like the potlatch, for example, is a way of, you know, we're, we're signaling to you by giving you all this stuff that, you know, you can trust us. And then it, then it comes back and we have reciprocity and, and expands the circle a little bit more to maybe the local tribes. And, and, it, and it requires really state societies to set up some kind of legal system and so on, or else people won't trust one another. Right. Uh, and, but then the question is, so it's possible through social contracts, through education, through cultural formation, it's possible to sort of nudge people, guide people in a certain direction. But the question I want to ask is even more fundamental. Should we even have that interest? I mean, is that a good thing to do? Like, uh, why would we be, be motivated to spend resources on everybody instead of mm. the most, the 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 seventy percent of the most promising and fit? I mean, that's the I mean, that's the question. Yeah, that's the hard question. You probably know about that research about diminishing returns on on um, on donations. The more people you present to somebody that are in need, the less money they give. Yeah. So you know, nonprofits have figured this out. I call this the Indugu effect from that. Film, that Jack Nicholson film about Schmidt, where he ends up adopting that little uh, boy from Africa named Indugu. And uh, because they show you a picture of little Indugu, and here he is, and he, here's his little soccer ball, and that's his little village where he lives in. So I feel like he's an honorary member of my family and my, my friends. 
Uh, but if if you show somebody ten Indugus or a thousand starving kids in Kenya, right. then then the uh, rates of donation plummet. Yes, uh, that's exactly. it, that, that's the problem you're talking about. Yeah, that's one of them. So the first one I've been emphasizing is the the a problem of unjustified egalitarian universalism. Like, why really is it every human being on earth is is sort of I should have an egalitarian and moral uh, orientation toward and moral concern for. The second problem is what I call the problem of the shrewd opportunist. Uh, Socrates called this a Glaucon's challenge, and Hume called it the problem of the sensible knave, and that is, okay, let's suppose we have a moral system. It's not accountable to any divine being. Uh, we have laws and social pressures to sort of encourage everyone to go by it. The question is, is there, if somebody says, this is the this is the shrewd opportunist position. Somebody says, "Oh well, I want everyone else to always uphold the moral law that we've established, but under condition, and I normally will, but under conditions when I can do something that violates the moral law, it benefits me, and I know I can get away with it, or I'm quite confident. Why not? So, his normally by, to follow what's morally right all the time." not to selectively free ride on the common good. So the question is, uh, if there's a God that you can answer, why shouldn't I do that? If, the, if we live in an atheist universe, it's not at all clear to me why the problem of the shrewd opportunist doesn't uh, beset us all the time. Right. So I, I guess um, the argument I would make for, to that would be start with someone like Peter Singer in, in the expanding circle that historically we have been solving that problem just by, well, by what? Not just laws and, and, and governments and states, but more of a bottom-up process of expanding our moral sentiments, our, expanding the moral circle to include more people in it. Now, why that's happened is a little trickier. You know, Steve Pinker talks about this in, in The Better Angels, and and I do a little bit in The Moral Arc, but it, it, it it's still not clear, you know, through pop culture, through writing, through um, television, and, and, and so on. Now the Internet, we, you know, we, we, we start thinking of other people on the other side of the planet as honorary members of our clan or tribe or whatever, so that essentially the tribe is just getting bigger. Now, it's not inevitable. There's no metaphysical force pushing us in that direction, mm -hmm. although sometimes it feels like that, um, that, uh, you know, so, I mean, I don't know if you, you count that as part of natural law, that somehow or another we, we're we able to do this and expand those circles. Yeah. So my view is, uh, yeah, there's definitely something to that. And I, to some degree, buy into Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments. Like, mm -hmm. there is something natural to human beings that just under certain conditions, at least, feels for others who are suffering. I mean, I just think that's an empirical fact. However, countering that is also in human nature, I think, a realistic account of human nature. There's very strong tendencies in human beings also to focus on the egoism, tribalism. Um, and for some cultures and human beings, uh, an enjoyment of seeing other people deprived or even suffering. So there's a, I think, I think human beings also have a, and oftentimes this is denied in sort of modern humanism, whether religious or secular, there's a strong dark streak in humanity that I think puts severe limits on at least a lot of people's capacities to sort of expand the moral concern to a global level. And uh, if it, to, we started off our conversation talking about politics and you simply look at people's public rationales for why they vote for whoever. It's pretty frightening sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all sociologically. That's all set in a social economic context that people, but um, I, I think whatever moral system we try to embrace and, and advance has got to take the darkness in human nature quite seriously. Yeah. I'm not sure religion actually does that, though. I mean, if we're going to pick on atheism or humanism or whatever, I mean, you still have the problem of, of religions themselves, even if they believe in an outside objective source of morality. Uh, the problem is, is they're in conflict with one another, and they each think they have the correct one true morality. That can't be resolved. 
uh, yeah, another so outside I, source. I, I, I'm not here at all to defend yeah, religion I understand, in any I understand sense. It, yeah. I really, one way to read my book is, is as follows. Oh, okay, if we wanted to be atheists, you know, what is the most reasonable, the most defensible, the most realistic um, in, set of implications that come from that? In other words, if we're going to do that, then let's get it right. Let's not overshoot. And let's not be unrealistic. Let's be honest about what the implications are. And so I'm simply in the book saying, as far as I can tell, I could be wrong. I'd like to be persuaded otherwise, otherwise excuse me. But as far as I can tell, we have reason, human beings who are atheists have reason to be modestly good, but not stupendously good. Yeah. That's all I'm saying, basically. Yeah, in the first yeah, yeah, part. yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a modest uh, observation that may be true. Uh, I just had uh, Cass Sunstein on the on the podcast. You know, the, he, he does the nudge stuff. You know, and he, mm -hmm. he makes pretty pretty strong case that most of the time, most of us make pretty bad decisions, or we don't know what we're doing when we make decisions, and so we kind of need uh, somebody to nudge us in the right direction. His idea of freedom is not just you can do whatever you want because most of us don't know what we're doing. So right. once we have knowledge about, let's say, these are the best healthcare plans, or, or in my case in California, we have an opt out program for organ donations, whereas in in Oregon they have an opt in uh, system where no, sorry, it's the reverse. <laughs> so in Oregon you are giving your organs if you're killed, unless you opt out of that, and they have mm -hmm. much higher rates than us. So, but but to pull back to make your point, who's making the decision that organ donation is a good thing? Yeah. Well, why should we assume that? Well, we. Yep. Okay. Okay. But we do. So something's happened that that we've been moving in that direction more and more over the centuries. Why? Well, I think part of it may be that, uh, that all the philosophical traditions from Aristotle to you know Kant and Hume and Rawls and so on have been kind of adding up into arguments that can be made that that's why we should do those things. Um, you know. So just. Another example that comes to mind, what, why should we in America care about female genital mutilation in Somalia, for mm -hmm, example? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why is that any of our business to go over there and impose our Western capitalist imperialist values and so on right, on, on another right. people? Well, because do these women really flourish and benefit from this practice? No, we, we would argue. Although I suppose you could find somebody who says, yes, we think it's a good thing. Well, the, the people that do this. Do the deed, yes, I suppose they would say that. But the women themselves, maybe some say, yes, I like it, but most don't. And then you get to this problem of do people really know what they want? Uh, what's mm. the best way to, to flourish? And, you know, it seems to me when, when, when there's a, a case for some people on the other side of the world that are crying out for help because they're under an oppressed dictatorship, we have a moral obligation to help them. Okay, Why? Well, because that's kind of the Western tradition that you would, you and people like you and Ben Shapiro and, and, and Dinesh D'Souza would argue come from this Judeo-Christian uh, idea of we're created in God's image, although you're not making that argument now, but that, but, but that is part of that tradition. Mm -hmm. um, I say, well, it's just part of this expanding moral sphere that we've been developing for centuries. Um, where that comes from, well, I do think, like with Adam Smith, we are born with this the capacity to care about and have empathy for others. And all you got to do is tweak the dials a little bit to get people to care about somebody they've never seen before. Mm -hmm. So there are two, ver there are two versions I could imagine of what you're saying there. If you could clarify one is um, this is what's developed in our Western heritage and it's better. I mean, I think it's, and it's more right than other cultural civilizational traditions. Or are you saying, well, this is what we've received, and we like it, and it, we think it works pretty well, and therefore we're going to get other people to believe it too. I mean, are you making a strong claim that this is more true or more right, or are you saying this is us and we might as well push what we are? <laughs> uh, probably more of the former. Here's how I, I said it here in this, this uh, paper I wrote. Uh, it is my hypothesis that in the same way that Galileo and Newton discovered physical laws and principles about the natural world that really are out there, so too have social scientists discovered moral laws and principles about human nature and society that really do exist. Just as it was inevitable that the astronomer Johannes Kepler would discover that planets have elliptical orbits, 
given that he was making accurate astronomical measurements, and given that planets really do travel in elliptical orbits, he could hardly have discovered anything else. Scientists studying political, economic, social, and moral subjects will discover certain things that are true in these fields of inquiry. For example, democracies are better than autocracies. Market economies are superior to command economies. Torture and the death penalty do not curb crime. Burning women as witches is a fallacious idea. That women are not too weak and emotional to run companies or countries. And most poignantly, that blacks do not like being enslaved and that Jews do not want to be exterminated. Why? Well, because we have this inborn natural desire to survive and, and flourish. And, and, and here I like uh, Pinker's example that he uses um, in, I think this is in Enlightenment now, um, that on this analogy, we are born with a rudimentary, he's making an analogy with mathematics. Mm -hmm. We're born with a rudimentary concept of number, but as soon as we build on it with formal mathematical reasoning, the nature of mathematical reality forces us to discover some truths and not others. No one who understands the concept of two, the concept of four, and the concept of addition can come to any conclusion but that two plus two equals four. Perhaps we are born with a rudimentary moral sense, and as soon as we build on it with moral reasoning, the nature of moral reality forces us to some conclusions and not others. For example, he says, if I appeal to you to do anything that affects me, to get off my foot or tell me the time or not run me over with your car, then I can't do it in a way that privileges my interests over yours, say, retaining my right to run you over with my car, if I want you to take me seriously. Unless I'm a galactic overlord, I have to state my case in a way that would force me to treat you in kind. I can't act as if my interests are special just because I'm me and you are not, any more than I can persuade you that the spot I'm standing on is a special place in the universe just because I happen to be standing on it. Now, Steve attributes this to Spinoza's viewpoint of eternity, the social contract of Hobbes, Rousseau and Locke, Kant's categorical imperative, Rawls' veil of ignorance, Peter Singer's expanding circle, and so on. Um, in other words, it's not science in a narrow sense, like we turn to the paleontologist to tell us what's right or wrong, but all of human knowledge has been building toward this, and in a way, discovering it by just experimenting and trying different things. If I want you to take me seriously, I can't favor my position over yours, this principle of interchangeable perspective. We've kind of discovered that's a, a really objectively, whatever that, maybe that's not the right word, truth. Okay, so there's there are a lot of things there that, that are merit discussion, but the one I want to push on is uh, Pinker's argument that you just described is a functionalist argument. If I want to be taken seriously under the right social arrangements, I need to take other people seriously. So if I want an outcome that I want, then I have to play by a certain set of rules. That's a, that's a logically different kind of argument that I, on moral principled grounds, owe other people a certain kind of respect and a treatment in an egalitarian framework, not because of a functional outcome, but because that's the truth, because that's the way things ought to be in some strong sense of the word ought. Mm. I don't know, that may be related to what you mean by objectively. So uh, I think those are two different things, and I think the functionalist argument's totally right, but the problem is many times we can get what we want, or human beings can get what they want without having to worry about what other people are going to do. Social structures are set up in a way that people can take advantage of others. People can externalize the costs of their consumption onto other people. So the question is, if we escape the framework of, um, well, there are consequences for me, so therefore I need to act a certain way. Can we justify treating people in an egalitarian, as human beings with rights and dignity and all this? Can we justify that? Um, how and why? It's not clear to me you, you how mean, and why. You mean justify it just through um, some because principles, right. regardless yeah. of... so. Outside of utilitarian type consequentialist yeah, outside arguments, of practical yeah. a consequentialist ethics, yeah, it just is the case. Yeah, like, I don't Kant, think so. Kant's, Kant's categorical imperative. I mean, you should treat everyone in a certain way because that's what you should do. As if, well, why? Right. Kant, Kant's, a lot of people think Kant's ethics are secular. In fact, he believed that it was essential 
uh, in his system, it was essential to have God operating in the background to have mm-hmm. a notion of the highest good. Mm-hmm. So we may or may not be able to secularize Kant, but a, a lot of these inherited systems, even after the Enlightenment, or even champions of the Enlightenment, still assumed perhaps a deist God, but some kind of higher power running in the background. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I guess I just always want to push back on sort of, it seems to me that sometimes there's a smuggling in of a normative assumption of, well, we should do this. And I just want to know, where did that come from? Well, I I guess the best I could do on that would be the, the consequentialist. I want you to take me seriously because I want to survive and flourish. That comes from evolution, just genetics. We're just born with yeah. a desire to live and, and, and survive and, and thrive and so forth. Um, and then you just build from there. Um, why should I care that you have that same principle or that same desire in nature outside of its consequences for me? I don't know. <laughs> uh, in the sense that if there's no God to hand down the principles, then then they, they only come other than we just say so and enact it into law. We, we create a bill of rights and say, well, but then why is, should we yeah. care to even go to the trouble of making the law? I mean, for, we might say, okay, in the United States, we want a certain kind of society. We're going to, we're going to order it this way. And if you don't like it, it's too bad. Here's what we want or the most of us want. Yeah. But if, even if you and I agree, human beings are oriented in the, as a life principle to their own thriving, so, pe- so there's a there's a pandemic on some other continent that's killing people off. A lot of human beings are going to say, "I'm sorry to hear that. I can't do anything about it. It's not my problem." But they may not even say, "I'm sorry to hear that." They may just say, <laughs> right. "Those right. people are, you know, like what Trump said about certain African nations, and <laughs> right. it's like that's their problem." Right. So the question is, um, I really do think. If you start off with the presupposition there is a loving God, you can make an argument for why you should care about those people. If you don't, uh, and I'm not saying it's a rational place to begin that there is a loving God, but if you start there, if you don't start there, it's not clear to me how to persuade someone that they should care about, like give a really good reason. Besides a consequentialist. Yeah, because they're going to say there aren't consequences. Now, if you say, well, the world economy will be hurt by a half a percentage point of well, GDP growth, yeah, yeah, yeah. people will be like, I don't, yeah, fine, whatever. I'm doing well. Right. And I don't know how to persuade them beyond that. Or, or though, even if, even if they do say, yeah, okay, that's a good argument. I think I will make a donation. That's still a consequentialist yeah, argument. Yeah. So, but again, to be clear, I'm not saying atheism turns everyone into jerks. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. think that. Yeah, yeah. It's just that I think the high demanding uh, really high standards of morality, I don't think they have a basis, a rational basis in an atheist universe. Yeah. Well, um, I guess... I wish they did, because it would make the world a better, a nicer place. Well, I think I think it's there, even if it's not objective or if it's outside, just by us saying that it's better. Even if you don't have to... It's like, like when the UN... Uh, you know, pass the universal um, human rights document. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, they said, uh, you know, we've we've all agreed on these, uh, 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 as long as you don't ask us to justify it. <laughs> right. Uh, I think one reason we still have, uh, you know, if you take a class in moral philosophy, you go through, you know, Aristotle and Kant and Hume and Rawls and uh, utilitarianism and you know, rule utilitarianism and, and, and so forth. You go, you, there's a reason why we still have all those different moral systems in place, because no one of them works, a- including any of the religious ones, uh, for a universal human ethic or, or to answer all the different problems of moral dilemmas, abortion, immigration, wh- whatever, capital punishment. No one of them explains all of these answers, uh, so, so answers all these questions. And so, therefore, I, I, I think this is the best we can do. That's it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I don't know if that's overreaching, but it's it's reaching. Yeah. I, I'm glad people are reaching rather than settling for barbarism. But uh, as thinkers, which you and I are and many other people are, we, don't, we want to be able to explain our reaching. So back to the UN uh, Declaration of Human Rights. 
they didn't say there's no good reasons for believing in universal human rights. They said we have different bases upon which we ground these and we don't have to agree together on the one right basis. That's different from saying uh, we want to have a regime of human rights. We can't really explain why. Yeah. But we just want that. And my my concern is uh, if the sociological reading of how we got to where we are is correct, not you and I or our children, but say our great grandchildren might. If the world becomes, let's say, a mind experiment, 100 percent atheist, that's not going to happen. But they say, well, what? Who thought of this? Like, what? why that? That's crazy. Like, I, I take care of me and my own, and I'm a good person, but I'm not responsible for everyone else. And everyone doesn't have rights. Some people forfeit their rights, and some people shouldn't deserve to live. I mean, that can be carried on. And In other words, if there isn't really a good explanatory rationale and motivating, motivating justification, in the future, I think people could be justified in saying, I'm not sure I believe that at all. Why should I believe that? Yeah. Why should we even have laws to that effect? Yeah. Well, the universal human rights idea is that if you ask people around the world what they would prefer, do they prefer to live in freedom in a democracy versus slavery in a, in a dictatorship or autocracy? Would you rather be in South Korea or North Korea? Uh, you'll get your answer. That seems to me a form of data collection about what people really want and therefore a kind of scientific conclusion about what's right. So wrong. the question, though, is not what people want for themselves. The question is what moral systems ask of everybody to contribute to sustain that. And some people might say, well, I like the life I have. I'm enjoying it, but I can't I can't worry about people in another context that aren't enjoying that. That Well, that's true. That, that That is true until people get more prosperous. So the more prosperous they are, the more they care about, say, global warming and their mm -hmm. environment and species extinctions mm -hmm. and things like that. So, but what you're, I guess what you're arguing is like, why should we care about species extinction and the environment in the first place beyond a consequentialist argument that, well, I, I want my children to have a nice place to live or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't see how, I don't see how God gives us that answer either, uh, particularly since they're conflicting moral values or moral systems. You know, like just, just about how the Christian religion has responded to environmentalism, some say, you know, God gave us this, the, 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 the animals in the earth to, to use to, for our, our own benefit. Mm -hmm. Other Christians say, no, no, we have a moral obligation to take care of the earth and sustain it. And, you know, there is that ongoing debate just in the Christian religion. So why, what's the answer to that? Where, how do you get objective answer right and wrong from Christianity in that sense? Yeah, I think re different religions can give different accounts that if you accept their premises, um, can be internally coherent. Again, I'm not here to justify them or to spin that out. And I do think religious pluralism creates a huge problem for religiously grounded ethics. But my point here is let's suppose we accept what you just said and say, okay, forget religions, they're not gonna be helpful. Let's be atheists. My only point in the first half of this book is we should not ask for too much because that could backfire. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was just going to your arguments about Kitcher and Sam Harris. Those are the two you primarily focus on. Um, Philip Kitcher, Sam Harris are, are the two primary. You know, Sam makes this argument, uh, uh, you know, let's just start off with the worst of all possible worlds where you, uh, where, where you just have maximum suffering of every human being. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Would you agree that it's objectively true that we want to move away from that left wall of maximum suffering toward a right wall of maximum flourishing? And would that, so his argument, that's an objective moral value. Yeah, I think that's true. I, well, I'm not sure it's an objective moral value. It's a description of what people would want. And those aren't the same things. Mm. Even if 100% of humanity would want an improve, less, yeah, reduce suffering for themselves, that's a different kind of, it's an ontologically different kind of claim than uh, it's an objective moral truth. Unless we, unless we change what we mean by objective moral truth. And I forget what Kitcher's argument was along those lines, too. He had something like that. Well, Kitcher's argument is, you know, since the beginning of proto-humanity, we have been developing based on what we need socially, based on our sense of fairness and sharing of resources among each other from the most elementary tribal hunting-gathering societies, senses of justice. 
and as we and it's a human project that's developmental and so as we have sort of evolved as as a as a species that has become part of our nature to want justice to want fairness to want equality that's a descript to me that's a descript descriptive account that may or may not be true but it doesn't provide quote unquote objective reasons for if somebody wants to skirt that system or to gain that system why they are quote unquote wrong yeah I guess, yeah, I guess I'd have to agree that it, it's all overreaching in that sense, including by religions. Theism doesn't give us that either, I don't think, mainly because it relies on some particular holy book that there are more than one, and they don't agree with each other, and there's no outside source to say, well, which is the right one, because each has its own outside source of God, uh, claiming that they know what what the deity says is right and wrong, and and they're in conflict. So, what's a anthropologist from Mars to des- decide which is the right one when they yeah. they they study well, that's, a, that's essentially an epistemological problem. There are multiple claims to truth. How do we know which is the yeah. truth? Yeah. Uh, your response seems to be to go into is to just reject them all. In theory, it could be that one or more than one is the truth, and others are wrong. We just can't figure that out. Yeah. But we had the same problem with social orders. I know people in China who think the United States is an insane way to order society. It's <laughs> chaotic. The individualism is crazy. There's so much anomie here. There's so much breakdown. They think it's better to have a collectivistic, solidarity-oriented, top-down system. Mm-hmm. They think objectively it functions better. Mm-hmm. But what do I tell them? I certainly don't say, well, they're all wrong. Come to America. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, but I, I'm in principle, I'm raising this problem of pluralism. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, if yeah. other people think differently, how do you adjudicate between them? Yeah. You're not ready to become a total relativist. You really think there's an order to reality that suggests things are some better, some things are better than others. I don't think anybody's a total relativist really. Cause if you, you, know, you push anybody, like uh, I, I always like to quote Abraham Lincoln, if slavery is not wrong, nothing's wrong. Oh, pretty much everybody today would say, yeah, slavery is wrong, although two centuries ago. There's a huge amount of slavery they, that goes on all over the world. Well, there's still, it, there's yeah, a sla- resurgence of it. Yeah, slave, well, slave labor, but not legally. It, it's Not you know, legally. Right. I mean, we've won the battle of legals. Le- legal. Uh, for about, now. For, well, I don't think that that's unlikely to change. I, I can't imagine any state rewriting its constitution and, and putting slavery back in as a legal institution. It's, it, what, what happens now is slave labor and sex trafficking is mostly in failed states or states, governments that can't enforce their laws. But it's, it's illegal in every country. So we've won that battle. In that sense, why? Well, because we, we have this kind of universal ethic. Now, Christians will give credit to Wilberforce and the, and the Quakers and so on, but, um, but, but who were their primary opponents when they were arguing for those, that universal moral principle? It was their fellow Christians uh, who were uh, in support of slavery. So, again, I, I don't see how theism or any one particular religion gives us a moral value. Historically, it doesn't look like that. So I have a sociological question for you. It's a skeptical question. Do you think what do you do you think it's possible that your sort of secular humanism in the way you've articulated it is heavily dependent upon material prosperity to survive? That is, what if the world sort of took a bad turn, the, the grid went down, states started failing, you know, debt caught up with every does it require life to be comfortable and okay and grocery stores and electricity and all for that view to be plausible um a minimum amount yeah you Mm -hmm. need you know you need three square meals a day and a roof over your head running water and so Mm -hmm. on all the the benefits we've gotten from science and technology and medicine in the last two centuries have made life objectively better again who cares about global warming and in the clean environment if i don't have anything to eat um, and, and so it does require some minimum. Be, uh, above mm-hmm. that, I, I think, and you know, if we want to get into happiness versus meaningfulness, um, it it only gets you happiness to a certain level, like maybe fifty thousand dollars a year or something to ha- to have those basics, health care and so forth. After that, it it, it uh, you you get a meaningful life from other activities that do have to do with 
helping other people. One, one thing you can do is, you know, volunteer for nonprofits, help other people, uh, and do and and do tasks that are beyond yourself. We know this from research that this makes people feel better about themselves, even though it's not fun. Uh, here I'm thinking of uh, Roy Baumeister's research on the difference between mm-hmm. happiness mm-hmm. and meaningfulness, and that mm-hmm. the example I like to use is is uh, care- caretaking for a parent. I, I, I did this for two of my four parents. I had step-parents. And it wasn't fun. I wasn't happy doing it, driving my dad around to all these hospitals and, and so forth. It was it was pretty stressful. But looking back, I feel better about myself. Like, that was a meaningful thing to do. And most people feel that way, you know, long-term versus short-term. Uh, you know, going out for drinks and dinner with my friends, that's a short-term uh, fun thing, makes me happy, but it doesn't give me meaning. So to get that, so the justifying motivation in the end, though, is you felt better. It's another. It's consequentialism. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's Not right. that it's a. It's an. It's sort of an objective duty or moral good to exercise filial piety or something. Well, like that. Uh, doesn't Aristotle argue that that the doing of it makes you feel as a better, makes you feel as you're yeah, a if, better person? Therefore, that's where virtue comes from. Yeah, Aristotle wouldn't emphasize the how do I feel. He would say, over the course of a lifetime, what kind of a character have I become? And you really only know that you're happy after you're dead, <laughs> really, because it's a life project. It's not a it's not a, a feeling at any given time. But the virtue comes from actually doing something. It's not enough to just say, well, I feel virtuous and I feel like I should yes, do something. Yes, certainly. Virtue is is exercised. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, again, I, I'm not sure there's a way around the the consequentialist trap. I, it, it does matter how I feel about myself doing something good for you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, ethical egoism. You know, every, is everything I do simply back to because I feel better about myself? Well, so back back to evolution. The argument I make is that it's not enough for me to pretend to be a good person by helping you, but I'm not really, I don't really care about you because we know that, say, psychopaths and sociopaths that manipulate people, Mm -hmm. people do catch on after a while. Like, this guy, he's just pretending to be my friend. He's not really my friend. So the evolutionary psychologists argue that we've evolved mechanisms for detecting cheating or free riding or deception, and, you know, this person doesn't really care about me. So real friendship requires some kind of sacrifice, but not in a Machiavellian way where you're just doing this to get something from me. Like, you have to really care about me. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you care about me through nonverbal cues and your voice and the things that you do, and, and I can kind of get through empathy and mind reading that you do care about me. You're not just pretending. And and the only way you could do that would be is if you actually feel that way about me. You actually really do care about somebody else. Because you can't fake it, you know. I mean, self-deception can only. It's kind of self, you know, Bob Trivers work on this de- deception and self-deception. People, if I'm just a deceiver, people will catch on to that. But if I believe the lie, not the lie, but you know, I believe what I'm doing is good. People will then see that I uh, I really do care. And the only way I can do that is if I actually do care for other people. Right. So back to the problem of the shrewd opportunist. If somebody consistently deceives others, they get found out pretty quickly. What if they're very successful, they're very shrewd, they're very successful at maintaining uh, a good reputation and people trust them. It's just that every now and then they find a way to break the social contract and benefit from it and are not caught. Have they done something objectively morally wrong or are they just, we actually should admire them because of how, how shrewd they are? Yeah. Right. Well, that is that is has what happened uh, in terms of evolution. So uh, just just to back up a little bit, um, the argument is that why uh, so we've evolved these cheater detection devices. We can tell when when somebody's free riding and cheating and so on. Why haven't we eliminated all of the defectors, cheaters, bullies, free riders, and so on? Mm-hmm. And and the answer seems to be that that would be too costly. It would require too much resources to put into mm-hmm. you know social control of other people. So um, one argument is that we end up with like 1% to 3% psychopaths because societies can survive reasonably well with that amount of cheating and free riding and bullying and and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it would require too much in terms of evolutionary natural selection resources to to get rid of all of them. Now, that's still a kind of consequentialist argument. Yeah, that's a completely functionalist answer. So So I gather what you would say is 
they that person has not violated an objectively a moral fact. They have violated what we've agreed how we want people to behave. Yeah. They violated a social contract, not an objective moral fact. There are no objective moral facts the, the, other than consequences for us yeah. given our nature. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I don't see a, a way around it that at some level there's still some consequentialism being uh-huh. put into the equation. Uh-huh. I don't see so why. another question I have, this is a very interesting discussion. Uh, thank you for that too. But another question I have is uh, you seem to have running in your system kind of a, a moral progress. I mean, you talk about moral pro- mm-hmm. humans making Yeah, totally, yeah. And I gather that's not because there's a, an objective moral law or natural law that humans are increasingly getting in touch with it's more like an unfolding of our own innate capacities or or higher orientation of our nature so the progress is relative to what standard what makes something progress instead of just change yes well um I, I am a progressivist in that sense. Uh, there's no force of nature pushing us in that direction. It could all go south. Not very likely at but this what point. what counts as south? Why would we even count it as south? Why isn't it just more change? Uh, well, because m- most people would not like to go back to slavery. or and just, just to pick the low-hanging fruit or, or go back to uh, women can't have the vote anymore. Uh, first of all, the women won't put up with that, but but all of us, most men, would not uh, in, embrace that idea. You know, let's let's reverse the Nineteenth Amendment, and you know, next year's the the centenary of the women getting the vote in the United States. Just for fun, let's let's reverse it. No one's going to go for that. Uh, why? Well, we've all had our consciousness raised. You know, Peter Singer would say the expanding circle has is encompassed that. And we're not going back. So, but, but why did it expand in the first place? Because the people that were being oppressed stood up and said, we're not putting up with this anymore. So, uh, again, it kind of comes from the bottom up. The laws change after there's already social pressure from below by the people who want those freedoms and want that better life for themselves. That's a kind of objective morality that they're telling us, this is what I want. Yeah, it seems to me there's some slippage between the fact of what people want and sort of sustainable moral truth. I mean, I I thought, I thought in an earlier time in my life, we'd reached a point where all presidents would be people who they might lie and whatever, but essentially they're, they're, they're not, they're not going to be just completely lying all the time, like (laughs) randomly corrupting (laughs) truth itself and all institutions that rely on truth much less in bed with the Russians. It's a, I would have thought like we were past that. I, I would have too. And I wrote the moral arc when Obama was president. So yeah, it like, seems to me that yeah, there are yeah. capacities to slip backwards. And if we that, don't have that, good, that's right, that's right. And if we put, don't have good moral arguments, good reasons to explain to our grandchildren, no, here's really why we were committed to that. Yeah. It's, it's open to all, all kinds of contestations of will. So, you know, that, that, that Putin uh, annexed the Crimea was a big news story, and we didn't do anything about it, probably because the consequences might have been worse. But that's much rarer now, that, that irredentism of, you know, redrawing the borders to move the border over here so I get more territory. You know, that used to be really common up until about the 1970s, 1980s, um, when pretty much the UN said, you, you're going to stop doing that or we're going to send in the blue-helmeted uh, <laughs> troops. Um, that seems to me a kind of progress over the centuries uh, that we're not going to put up with that kind of thing anymore. That it still happens, yes, of course, it's like the fact that there are still criminals or or hoodlums or, or people that burgle your home doesn't mean we shouldn't have laws against burglary. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do, and they work, and it's working better and better over time. But it's it's like the global warming curve. It's you know it's up and down, up and down. But the overall blade is going up. You know, the, 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 there is this real measurable progress, measurable in an objective way, in the sense that would you rather be would you rather have health care or no health care? Would you rather have food mm-hmm. or no food? Would you rather have water or no water? And so on. everybody would say yes. I would prefer you know to flourish than to not flourish. Uh, maybe that's not objective or whatever, but it's in our nature. And, and uh, so I would that, that's a kind of a natural law argument, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So essentially what we count as morality, 
is that which the majority, when they can get the power to demand it, say, here's what we want in order for us to get our share of flourishing. That's what morality is. Well, and, and expanding it for more and more other people to have the same thing. Again, I can't... Oh. I why proactively take it? Why not wait for them to just demand it for themselves? Why is it my responsibility to demand it for them? Well, it's not until you've got it. I mean, you, again, you have to take you have to flourish to a certain extent before you care about somebody else who's not flourishing. Right. So I I'm flourishing again. Why do I care about people dying of a disease in Central Africa? Well, why? Yeah, why? Well, because uh, you you brought up Adam Smith that you have this natural inclination to at least sometimes care about people on the other side of the world, and we've all been tweaking the dials of society to get nudge people in that direction to care more and more once they have their own basic needs met. That that's a kind of progress we've been experiencing over the centuries. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's maybe it's a purely utilitarian. Maybe utilitarianism is kind of shaking out to be the most common moral uh, philosophy that we've all intuitively adopted because it works. Again, I can't privilege myself if I want you to take me seriously, and I want you to take me seriously, even if it's just a consequential argument for me. It right. seems to work. Right. Have you, um, I won't, uh, utilitarianism in my view is hugely problematic, but we won't go there. But have you heard of the recent book by James Hunter and a co-author called Science and the Good? No, I don't know it's that book. It's just dealt by Yale University Press. Okay. And one of their arguments they make, and they're taking on people exactly like you, one of the arguments uh, they make, the subtitle is uh, The Tragic Project of si Finding a Scientific Basis for Morality. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. One of the claims is um, people like you, um, what you've, you haven't found a scientific basis of morality. You've just changed the definition of what will count as morals. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like you've just thrown out the old expectation of what we mean by morality and created a new one that's consequentialist and functionalist. If you want this, then you should do that. That's what we count as moral because we think we want this. You yes. may want to have you may want to have them on your show soon, yeah, that, but it's, that, it's yeah, no, I will one. no for sure because uh, but 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 what's the alternative to that? Then you, you get kind of a Kantian categorical imperative. Then what do you do about the problems with that? Where the Nazi knocks on the door and wants to know if you have Anne Frank? You know, of course you're going to lie. Yeah, what the alternative? My position isn't there are great alternatives. My position is. For purposes of this book and discussion, um, atheists shouldn't overreach in the kind of morality they call everyone to follow if they don't have good reasons to justify yeah, it. Yeah, okay, fair enough. All right, fair enough. Although, again, uh, back, back to where we started, I think there's reasons for that because we live in a Christian culture in which we're so often told that you can't be good without God. You know, our answer is, yes, we can. Well, what's the justification? And then you rifle through all the arguments we've been going through. Maybe yeah. there isn't one. Maybe it's utilitarianism is one. You know, sort of the imperative, the, the, the you know, Kantian categorical imperative is true. You know, let's just say it's provisionally true. In most circumstances, most of the time for most people, you shouldn't lie. But, of course, there are exceptions to that. Uh, you know, call that the lifeboat ethics example apply to that. Um, so there's... And, and again, like with Sam's um, moral landscape, there's multiple peaks on the moral landscape. I think the harder problem is is in the, the subtle differences. Like, do you think we should have a 10% income tax or a 15% income tax? Do you think a capital gains tax should be lower than income tax or higher? I don't see how science could ever solve that. I, I, I agree. That's just, you know, we're kind of fine-tuning the dials of what we think will nudge society slightly mm. more in this direction than that direction. That's just democracy. We're just going to vote and run the experiment for four years. Although, say, even there, I, I might say democracy is a kind of scientific experiment. You know, we have 50 different states. We have 50 di different constitutions. They, they all have, say, different gun control measures. We can kind of look and collect the data on, you know, how effective are those gun control measures as a kind of experiment. Now, I suppose you might respond to that saying, but why would we care about gun control at all? because we want to reduce gun violence. Yes, and most of us would agree to that, except conservatives may say, I shouldn't pick on conservatives, but to say people that really value guns would say, I don't care how many idiots with guns that don't 
maintain them properly accidentally shoot themselves or kill themselves in suicide. I want my guns for my personal security and freedom. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I have a more tragic and dark view of human beings in history than you do. I don't have as, as, as much faith that we, that we have standards by which we can measure commensurate goods or incommensurate goods on things like gun control and a host of other things. I, I think it's much more of a muddle, and I, 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 I fear much more for the future of things if, capital, if the global economy hits a big pothole. Mm-hmm. Or income inequality or something like that. But see, so, I see these as problems to solve. Why are we wanting to solve problems? Because we want there to be further progress. Why do we want that? I don't know. It's in our nature to want that. You know, I can't go, but there's nothing below that. You know, we've sort of hit an epistemological wall there. I don't know how to get around that because I'm a naturalist. I, there's no supernatural. There's nothing reaching right. in. But even right. if you say, well, but there's a super, there's this outside source, how do you know? That's b- back to the epistemological problem. Well, it's an epistemological problem. And I agree with you that um, a lot of the function of religious people arguing that atheism leads to utter nihilism, it that's not really uh, – in my point of view, the function of that is apologetics. I mean, they're trying to drive people into religion by saying that if you head down that road, it's chaos. And so I just don't find that plausible. And I don't think the argument should be um, worked out for for apologetics reasons one way or another. But in some sense, I think atheists should have more confidence and not be reacting against religious people who say, you're going to be A, B, and C, and X, Y, and Z, and just say, well, set that aside. Yeah. What on our own terms, on our own grounds, are we justified in believing and saying, and not let fundamentalists push us into saying um, unjustified things? Maybe they don't do that as much in European countries because it's far yeah. less religious than, than it yeah. used to be. And they do seem to take for granted that there are certain universal rights, uh, like health care, for example. Most of these northern European countries have much more um, universal health care programs that work effectively than we do. And our system that's more individualistic costs a lot more. Now we're kind of getting down down the rabbit hole of some other issue here. But I guess the point is, for some reason, they you know European countries have kind of embraced this universal – Declaration of Human Rights and pushed it more than Americans have, probably for historical and sociological reasons. But again, I would kind of look to that as they are seeing this long-term trend, this expanding moral sphere, and embracing that more. Um, I'll I'll, I'll give you an example that I don't fully embrace, but Bob Wright's book, Non-Zero. He makes this argument that in the long history of life, all the way back to you know the beginning, back to way before the Devonian, you know, the Precambrian, that um, there's been a slight uh, advantage of non-zero, um, win-win, cooperative games that have been played, all the way from single-cell organisms to multicellular organisms, all the way up to civilizations and so on. But just barely, it's like fifty-one forty-nine, mm-hmm. and that I mean, so so you know, there, we have our inner demons, we have our better angels. But Bob argues that the, the better angels have been winning out over the inner demons just slightly, just ever so slightly, and it's taken you know millions of years to get here, or thousands of years of civilization, and we're we're kind of seeing it nudge along there. Yes, it could go south if we you know tweak the dials wrong, but. Now, 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 Bob kind of goes that, that there might be some kind of metaphorical force pushing it along in, in a sort of a natural law way, not, not, a, not a theistic way. I'm not sure I go that far. It could, go all, it could all go south. But again, it's back to that idea of progress, that there's something, there's some advantage to playing non-zero games than zero-sum games. And that advantage organism... For, who? for the organism. For the organism. Yeah. For the species? Well, not for the individual. Yeah, just just for the individual. Now, there are uh-huh. some people like Ed Wilson and and um, David Sloan Wilson who embrace group selection. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't think there's good arguments for group selection. But that that would be kind of a moral argument for that the group actually cares in a way. I, I don't think that really makes sense. But so here's a mind experiment, just so I can better understand your position. If if a hundred years from now, thirty percent of the human race that had the know-how, the smarts, the power, the good genes, decided there would be a way to eliminate the 70% 
that's a that's a drain on everything that's ruining the world that it, that's a that's a hassle that's dumb that's ugly without them even knowing it they could zap them in their sleep so they would never <laughs> suffer yeah. and get rid of them and the human race as a, as a race would be um, better off would that be and they did that would that be like well the people that died without knowing they were going to die would have regretted that if they would have known that was coming they didn't get what they wanted but they're not around anymore, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, yeah. And it, like, would that be just that? Like, well, it's unfortunate for them, but that's life. Or would it be? Would there be some tragic element? Like, that's wrong. That yeah. shouldn't be. Everyone deserves yeah. to live a full happy. And that, then my question is, what is the basis of everyone deserving that? Yeah, it is wrong. It is wrong because I wouldn't want that done to me. So, but you know, it's. But it's, if you were part of the thirty percent, it wouldn't be done to you. Yeah, but but I could be part of the seventy percent. You know, again. So what? You but, weren't. <laughs> well, you I know, but, but, but yeah, no, no. So I would not go down that road. Obviously, I think there are some real uh, moral standards there. And, and uh, A, I don't know which group I'm going to be in. So that's a Rawlsian argument. That's or, a Rawlsian or argument. Or we can go just back to the golden rule. I, yeah, I wouldn't want that done to me. Um, and, you know, and that comes from many sources, not just religion. And, and that's that basic principle of interchangeable perspectives. It's still grounded in what I want. Yes, it's a consequential argument, but yeah, yeah so. <laughs> uh, but the, it's not a consequential argument if you know you're part of the 30%. It's not, it's not what you would want. It's what you're getting. Yeah. Uh, as a side, uh, this is the argument that um, Richard Rangham makes. I just had him on my podcast. Uh, the, the goodness paradox is his book. The paradox mm -hmm. is is back back to your uh, argument. Why shouldn't I just be completely selfish? And w why isn't our species like chimpanzees that are just violent all the time? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and his argument is self domestication. We have domesticated ourselves. We're more like. Um, bonobos than chimps that, mm -hmm. uh, and a little bit like the silver fox experiment in Russia where they've bred out the hostility simply by selecting over, you know, 50 generations or so now. And then they get all these peculiar other features, smaller jaws and teeth, the little white spot on the forehead and curly tails and floppy ears and so on. And he has an interesting explanation about that. Okay, but how did we self-domesticate? So one argument is the sort of capital punishment argument that We've executed and got rid of the the worst people in society, just eliminating them. I mean, literally eliminating them, uh, and that we've become just softer, nicer, more cooperative, more pro-social, more altruistic than, say, chimpanzees are. So, and, and I like that argument because it, it's it, it's putting it back in our nature. This is the way we are. Human nature is where our morals come from. They're transcended in a sense that it's outside of you and me. It's not just my opinion the American culture, Western culture, whatever, it's in our species nature to have these mm -hmm. moral propensities. That's as good as I can get in terms of outside source. So why not, why shouldn't we utilize science to do um, species enhancing intelligent eugenics? Well, it, in a sense, we, we've been, we are kind of doing that, but universally, you know, vaccinations, for example, and just getting – and the initial CRISPR-type technological fixes will be on things like uh, certain diseases and maybe hopefully Alzheimer's and things like that before you and I hit the wall. <laughs> They'll figure this out. Uh, and, of, of course, we don't want to apply this only to the elite – now, maybe initially only the wealthiest will be able to afford it, like only the wealthy could afford electric cars 10 years ago. Now, you know, anybody can buy one already, and I think that's how it would go. As long as we still have that kind of universal ethic, everyone should benefit from this. Yeah, I think that's the part of your I, – I think you and I share a lot of common ground, but I think the, the egalitarian universalism is the part where I'm not hearing an explanation for why you should be so committed to that. I'm not saying we shouldn't be. Yeah, I understand. Just, I, I just want to have. A, I just want to get why. Just because. <laughs> no, that doesn't sound like a good skeptic. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we we've kind of ground through the the problem is it, it's it's real. There is no outside of a kind of utilitarian argument, even a Kantian categorical imperative. I can think of exceptions. So, but but why? Well, it does come down to the consequences of line or truth telling or whatever um and there I, I think we often have competing 
competing rights that are conflicting rights that there is not one there's no one answer to it like say take the abortion issue um you know conservatives that i talk to um that you know that make good arguments i i have to acknowledge those are good arguments you know you really are killing a human life it's not just a potential it's a potential person not a legal person mm-hmm. yet until i think 6 months then a woman that's killed with a six-month fetus, it's a double homicide. So I think we recognize the personhood beginning still in the womb. But before that, say the first trimester, uh, there you end up in this kind of uh, sliding spectrum of when a human life begins and so on. And so the, the pro-choicers have arguments on that to counter the pro-life. And it, it kind of I could see it going either way. And then I, I fall slightly on the side of pro-choice simply because of the long historical suppression of women's rights and choices by men for really good evolutionary reasons that that we would not embrace today of controlling women's reproductive rights. So I come out on the side of pro-choice even while recognizing that the pro-lifers have good arguments. And there I think there is not there there isn't a correct answer. It's just like well which do you think is the more important right? And I don't see the theists as having the right answer either. Uh you know, they can say, well, God gave everybody, you know, the right to, okay, yeah, but you never practiced that until, you know, recently <laughs> in a more universal way. So you know, back to that epistemology problem. Right. I'm guessing you're Catholic, so you're probably pro-life. I'm not here to discuss abortion. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you that it's a really fraught and difficult issue. Well, but 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 just back, to, there, there can be conflicting rights. How, how do you how do you settle? Which I is, mean, that's 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 when I say I have a, a tragic view of things. It's I don't think everything lines up. I don't think all right. human goods are commensurate or right. that can be traded off against each other in any kind of reasonable calculus. Yeah. It's much more complex and difficult than that. That's what I mean by tragic. Yes. I uh, Yeah. I, I'm curious. Uh, also, this, the, the middle chapter in my book is about science and religion. Oh, can, yeah. 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 Let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that chapter. Yeah. Let's talk about that. And scientific evidence. Or can the evidence that science can produce definitively show that the theism is wrong? I mean, I, I'm basically saying it can't. And and a lot of it, some atheists, science writers, overreach by saying the, the, the empirical data shows there's no God. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Here's what I think about I just that. Don't see um, that. Uh, so the question is um, the burden of proof argument. So who who has the burden of proof? So the theist, so here's our argument, the theist that claims there's evidence for God, if I'm not convinced, I can simply say I don't accept that, and therefore the null hypothesis is that there is no God. Can I prove there's no God? No, I can't prove there's no God. Mm-hmm. And I'm not even sure how I would prove that there is a God in a scientific sense, in this sense, that if we discovered a, an intelligence capable of of creating life, even creating planets and solar systems, maybe even universes, that could be just a s- extremely a sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence as to be indistinguishable from God. What we conceive of God is omniscient, omnipotent, uh, and so forth. Uh, you know, we're so far away from those standards of perfection that I, I wouldn't know it if I saw it. It's an epistemological mm-hmm. problem. So something sufficiently advanced that that could you know create DNA and then create life forms and so on. Well, we're we're going to be able to do that technologically soon. I mean, look what CRISPR can do already. Um, that you know, given maybe fifty thousand years of more science and technology, those people would appear godlike to us. Or if mm-hmm. we encountered extraterrestrials, they're not going to be five years ahead of us uh, and, and encounter them in Roswell, New Mexico. They're you know they're going to be you know millions of years ahead of us capable of doing things we can't even conceive of, we would probably call them gods. So what's the difference there? So it's, it seems to me, I don't know what experiment we could ever run where I'd go, yep, there is a god, nope, there is no god. So in that sense, ontologically speaking, I'm an agnostic, the way mm-hmm. that Huxley mm-hmm. meant it when he said it's not knowable. Mm-hmm. Not just I'm waiting for one more experiment to come down the line before I make up my mind, like a global warming or something, uh, that it's not knowable. I don't know how you can – now, people like Dawkins and, and uh, say, um, uh, Vic Stanger, uh, physicists, make the argument that if there was a god, the world should be a certain way, and it isn't. Therefore, that's at least evidence against god's existence. And I kind of see that argument, although it's not the one I make. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So my very limited claim in the chapter that empirical evidence that science can produce itself can't 
establish that there's no God. You agree with that point? Yeah. It's a very limited point. Yeah. Right. That's my only point in that chapter. Yeah, and that's okay. But but what do you? Uh, yeah. it, I just I read some authors who I like what I'm reading, and then all of a sudden they say some it seems to me indefensible thing like the evidence shows there's no God. Like what evidence? Yeah, that that would be. I, I'd agree that's overreaching. Although, see, people like Dawkins, you know, he has that whole chapter why there very probably is not a God. He just puts yeah. it on a spectrum like I'm a six out of seven, or I forget what the number system yeah. is. But yeah, that's a whole different. That's yeah. a whole probabilistic argument. It's it's very different. Yeah. Well, I, I have to say, I mean, sociologically speaking, uh, in terms of the atheist movement. Um, you know, I was a born again evangelical in the seventies. I went to Pepperdine University, and and I was into it for about seven years, and then, and then I abandoned it for a variety of reasons. And uh, but but no one really cared. It didn't really matter because atheism wasn't really a thing. Mm -hmm. I, I went to a second after Pepperdine. I went to a sec secular university where no one was religious, or maybe they were. I don't know. No one ever talked about it. It really wasn't until the nineties that this whole science and religion thing sort of took off. And it's like, you know, are you, is it the conflict model or the overlapping model or the, you know, the non-overlapping magisteria of Steve Gould's mm -hmm. argument? Mm -hmm. And, and even then it was still kind of under the radar until uh, Richard's book in 2006, The God Delusion, that kind of launched atheism into the, into the stratosphere where then you had to kind of decide if you, you're going to be a militant atheist, an anti-theist. Right. And, and and agnosticism was, you know, you're just a pussy for not saying what you really believe. You know, it was like right, right. Uh, Stephen Colbert's joke was, you know, it's an atheist without balls. Come on, <laughs> say what you really think. And it, it became much more polarizing. And then atheism splintered yet again and this whole atheism plus, which is a social justice. You know, then, then it was involved in politics. And it's like, oh, boy, this is getting super messy now. Mm -hmm. And as you know, the rise of the nuns has been, you know, has been uh, really taken off. The, but they're not necessarily atheist, agnostic, skeptics, no, people that just have no, no religious A lot of the nuns pray and, and believe in God. Or something, some higher force or their... Do you know, uh, did you see, uh, it just came out this last week, for the first time ever in American history, the number of not religious uh, as a religion get, category, get, surpassed yeah. Catholic and Protestant. Yeah, I did see that. Yes. In the 2018 General Social Survey. Yeah, I, I tweeted that out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was a, and it, it was exactly in the mid 90s when the number of nuns started to rise right. hugely. Up until then, it was very stable. Yeah, yeah. I do remind my my fellow atheists that you know that's not, those aren't necessarily our people, so to speak. Uh, right. But politically, I, I like that because, you know, the Constitution should apply to everybody. You know, politicians should not be running as theologians. Uh, you know, they should care about everybody. And if a third of Americans, you know, have no religious affiliation, then you have, you have to take that into account. So that okay. part I like. Mm -hmm. and, but also I think it does nudge people toward, again, this progress, toward the idea of secular rights, that the rights stand regardless of what your religious positions are, or even if you're not religious, those are the rights that we embrace. Uh, anyway, so I, uh, I think that's, those are good trends. Although people like my friend Ben Shapiro or Danish D'Souza, they're very worried about this because they think America is, they're very pro-American. America is founded in Judeo-Christian values, and if those go away, we're in big trouble. I don't think so because we've already embraced those values. We've inculcated them into our thinking so deeply that we're very unlikely to abandon them even if we give up religion. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a that's a profoundly sociological question. Do things last after the grounds for them have been eroded? Um, Max Weber's Protestant ethic and spirit of capitalism is exactly that argument. Calvinism helped to generate capitalism. Calvinism right. disappeared. The capitalist spirit continues on. Right. Right. Well, because that would that would be the argument against the the Susas of the world. Yes. Right. I have a mixed. I mean, I write about it in the book, but I have a mixed mind about it. Which is? Uh, my view is uh, cultural formations like uh, human rights and so on can last a very long time without the original ontological assumptions that have been abandoned, but not forever. Eventually, mm -hmm. that's why I keep saying our great grandchildren are going to start to ask, why, am, why do I have to sacrifice to maintain this system? And if there's not a good reason, uh, I think they can abandon it. So part of what's built into my model of my book is the belief that I don't believe a good philosophical argument changes somebody's mind in the short term at all. Most people don't change their minds for any reason. Uh, but I think over the long run, 
in cultural terms, in terms of public discourse and argumentation, good reasons do eventually matter in cultural shifts that matter. And so uh, if atheists want to have a, a humanistic, universalistic, egalitarian world, I'm just, I'm just repeating the same argument yeah, now. Yeah. Not now, but in the long run, they got to have good reasons to justify it or else eventually it'll corrode, especially if there's something like world depression, breakdown of you know, the global economy, and life becomes much more difficult, people's barbaric tendencies much more likely to come out. Yeah. Well, it may be that the best arguments we have that are secular are these utilitarian consequentialist arguments with certain principles that we agree are deeply held and so on, maybe if only because of their consequences. That may be the best we have. But even if I'm wrong and you say to your great, great, great grandchildren, because God said we should be, do this, what if Islam is the dominant religion and not Christianity and the dominant uh, force within Islam is the people who believe in Sharia law and that God told us homosexuality is morally wrong and we should throw these people off the roofs of buildings. And that's what we think is, and we talk to God himself directly. That's our outside source. What what, what would a, a Christian in the minority say to that? Because they were originally making the argument, we have to talk to God to get the answer. Yeah. I think the best they could say would be um, those those kind of Muslims are wrong. Why are and they it's wrong? It's unfortunate that they've taken over. Yeah, but why are they wrong? Because there is a loving God that doesn't want people murdered like that. They believe there's a loving God and they have the right one. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. they would think that. I mean, there's 1.5 billion Muslims that think you're going to hell because you picked the wrong religion. How do you know they're right. wrong? So there's a difference between um, how do we know and what really is. There's yeah. an epistemological question and a sort of a moral facts or ontology question. Yeah, but how do you... I, I'm not saying... Look, again, I'm not saying in this book, I have the answers. I know, but, is right, Anything like that. But but what do you think? I, I mean, want, what, why are they wrong? I don't I don't see I, how you can disentangle... I'm saying, if, in, in, if, in, in, if you start off with Christian presuppositions, yeah. if you can, then it's inherent, it's internally coherent why being made in God's image, God unites God's self with humanity in the incarnation... God commands people to love as God loves, et cetera, et cetera. It's internally coherent why you should care about everybody on the earth, every human being. Okay. But if, if the whole, if, if 80, if, if 98 percent of the world becomes Nazis, at least you would say, well, that's wrong. You'd have a ba an internally coherent reason for judging that to be wrong. But, but where did you get that idea in the first place? from what you believe to be revelation. <laughs> right. Okay, but that's not a reliable form of uh, knowledge. Epistemologically, that's a problematic way to get knowledge. Because Islam, Muslims say, well, we got it from revelation. Well, Muhammad, no, no, probably, Muhammad talked I know to God. That there are serious, serious limitations with that. Yeah. Okay. Well, so there we are. Yep. We're at the same, we have the same problem. I don't, yeah. see, I don't I, think you can disentangle epistemology from ontology. Uh, you know, the nature of reality, it is what it is, yes, but, you know, we have to know it somehow. Right. So here's how I read. If I, if I zoom out to 30,000 feet and, and look at this whole discussion and all related discussions, what I see is this. We human beings have a massive amount of pluralism about our moral beliefs, our political command. It's just almost chaos, but at least a lot of pluralism. The effort that you're engaged in and that Sam Harris and many other people are engaged in are an is an attempt to try to reach some kind of universally compelling standards or system based on the, the universal authority of science and grounded in nature, like the way things are. You can't argue with the way things are. It's just the way things are. Right. To provide some way to counter the chaos of pluralism and disagreement. Yeah, I agree. I think we're all on that journey. Everybody. You think you think well, okay. Fundamentalist Christians no, are on no, that journey. No, 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 no. Sorry. <laughs> Most of us are trying to figure that out. I should say intellectuals that are thinking about and talking about these things. I think thoughtful human beings are should be wrestling with the problem of what do we do with our destructive potentially destructive pluralism? How do we get beyond the well you say and I say and you feel and I feel? 
But I think that's that's the larger sort of moral, almost you might say, a human spiritual project that's behind what you're trying to do, which is, can we get some grounding for a more consensus about how we should organize our lives and agree on what is quote unquote good and bad? Yeah. Well, it's not a problem as, as long as you leave me alone and and I, and I leave you alone. The problem is when they come into conflict, uh, when a choice yeah. has to be made politically or whatever, say capital punishment, we're either going to have it or we're not, and there's consequences on which decision we make. You know, there, if there's not a correct answer, then we just experiment and try different things and, and we settle it by democracy, by vote. Right. If other people accept democracy. Well, that's right. But then that also goes back to, are you happy to leave female genital mutilation alone if that's what they want to do? Or do you want a world in which that gets outlawed? I want a world where that's outlawed. Absolutely. Okay. So it's not just live and let live. No, 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 no. Because there are certain deeper moral principles that I, I, I think are derived by, in that particular case, by the women themselves don't want this. Uh, now, you can't ask a one-year-old or whatever if they're doing it to an infant. But we can project what they would be thinking because you can ask adult women like I and Hersey Alley, how do you feel about this? She'll tell us. Um, that, I, though, I would put in a different category than, say, wearing the burqa. You know, you know clothing well, is not a permanent altering of somebody's potential to live a full, uh, enriched life. Do you think uh, – would you prefer a world in which um, – children are not allowed to go to a fundamentalist religious school because no, that will no, no. pair their mental formation? No, I, I, there I, I, I put as a higher moral value and right uh, to freedom of education, speech, choice, and so on. Uh, I would never want to pass a law that says parents can't send their kids to a private school that's fundamentalist, something like that. The, the, the conflict comes, say, with public schools where we all have to you know, kick in tax money to pay for the school and the First Amendment prohibits the government from favoring one religion. There I do object to, say, the teaching of creationism in public schools because that is imposing one particular religious. But I'm not against parents doing that. Again, parents like you know, the, the sort of vaccination thing that's in the news now, um, generally I'm in favor of parents doing whatever they want with their kids because they're their kids, none of my business. But in the case where there's consequences for other people – the unvaccinated kids go to a public park or a public school or library or Disneyland or whatever, and, and they cause harm to other people, then, yeah, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just stepping back and reflecting on all this and of what yours, what I've read, uh, I think we actually share a number of underlying orientations um, uh, that the is informs the ought and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but just for the record, I still have a sense, I'd have to read a lot more of your stuff and think and talk. I have a sense that there's, you're still wanting to have your cake and eat it too in some ways. Uh, it doesn't all add up. Or if I was Nietzsche and I would say, you're smuggling in the back door some <laughs> things that are not consistent with your first principles. But that may be. I, uh, it would, it, I think the conversations are really good to have and to try to sort this stuff out. Totally. That's what we're doing. That's what this is all about. Um, mm. I don't. I don't have the answer. All the answers, of course. I'm not even a moral philosopher. I, I just dabble in it, simply because uh, as a social scientist, I'm interested in, um, you know, the consequences of certain st social structures for human flourishing. Say something like that. As a secularist, atheist, whatever I am, um, not a, a naturalist. You know, I, I still want there to be some kind of basis for morality. Call it what you will. I call it provisional morality. There are certain principles that are provisionally true for most people, most places, most of the time, with obvious exceptions uh, here and there. So it's sort of you know quasi-utilitarian Kantian. I don't know what the answer is. There's a reason why we still talk about all of those different moral philosophies because <laughs> none of them work in all circumstances. There is no <laughs> universal ethic. So it's it, it can only ever be an ongoing conversation about <laughs> this particular problem, and you try these three or four different moral philosophies, which one seems to solve the problem best without it being 100%? It seems to me that's what we're stuck with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess where I keep, I keep hitting the rocks on what I hear you say is best by what system of values yeah. it 
flourishing can look, so, especially since we're cultural beings that can be formed to enjoy different things, to want different things, to respond to different things, not absolutely, but within a range. Uh, what works? Yeah. By what standard? By what standard, yes. What's right. the good outcome by what standard? Right. It's easy as it's easy to say in a Sam Harris way. Well, if we were all totally miserable, that wouldn't work. Okay, fine. That's an extreme. Right. What about a more realistic in the set of range of options? In the middle, it's much messier, for sure. Yeah. Again, you know, which is the right tax system? I don't know. <laughs> you know, there is no right tax system. It's, you know, it depends what you want, for who, at what period of time and so on. There is no right answer. Maybe that's a good place to end it, Christian. We've been going uh, well over an hour and a half. Uh, it's yeah, it was super interesting. interesting. It was good. I enjoyed it. I'm really glad we solved the technology problem. My apologies for not having. Oh yeah, that. no, it's all it's all good, and uh, I, I highly recommend the book. Uh, people read the book. It's it's a super interesting, stimulating. Wherever you stand on these uh, issues, and and the fact that there's even. Uh, a problem of atheist overreach, if that's mm. true, even that's an interesting problem. The yeah. fact that we even have a cohort of people that are trying to solve the problems is interesting, even if it's not done correctly. Mm -hmm. So thank good. you. Well, I also do recommend the uh, the Hunter book, Science and the Good. I think you'd find oh, yeah. it really interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to he's them. A, he's at University of Virginia. Okay. Yeah, Yale University Press. Uh, I will overreach to him. <laughs> Great. Cool. Well, good to meet you in person. Thank you, Christian. Take care. Yeah, take care. All, All right. Bye bye. bye, -bye.